Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the NCBI webinar today. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of new BLAST databases. Uh, you should be seeing a preliminary slide that talks about some just some background stuff for the webinar. Uh, Wayne Matten is uh, manning the chat pod, the questions pod, and he'll answer those um, as they come in. You'll also have time at the end to answer a few maybe of interest to everybody. Um, if there are questions and answers, we will have them available after the webinar. And uh, we'll make those available linked to the webinar page so you can see them. There is a um, directory on the FTP site, and that compressed URL there, the bit.ly URL there, will take you there. And that's got the slides that you're looking at now, um, as well as some notes that I'm going to be using when we do some live searches. And the Q&A will be there as well. Okay, so the title of this webinar is about some new BLAST databases. And I say they give cleaner results, not to say that the current BLAST databases give dirty results, but these give results that are perhaps easier to interpret. Um, my email address, by the way, is on there. So if you have any questions about the content of this, you can write to me directly, uh, peter.cooper at nih.gov. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I'll talk a little bit about the current status of the BLAST databases. In particular, the two default databases that are used by almost everybody who uses BLAST at NCBI. Um, just to point out what the problems are with those and why the new two new databases I'm going to talk about um, are useful. The first one is a protein database called the Landmark Database. It's the same database used by SmartBLAST. The second one is a nucleotide database that's looking at genomic data. Uh, it's called the RefSeq Representative Genomes Database. Both these bit databases are now available on the regular um, CDI BLAST pages, and I'll just point out to you that you can download them, and then if we have some time, I'll show you some live results from these databases um, using the BLAST service. So most people that are listening to this webinar use BLAST, I assume, and what we know from looking at our web logs is that almost everybody that uses BLAST with the vast majority of people search the default databases, the protein database is called NR. Uh, the nucleotide database is also called NR. We think of it as NP. Um, these are very large uh, non-redundant databases, and you can see the sizes of them there in terms of the number of sequences and the number of total bases or residues, whatever you want to call them. There are some issues with using these databases. They're very large data sets. They're slow searches sometimes, especially if the sequence you're searching with is highly represented in the database, which the related sequences is. Um, they're computationally expensive to search. The other thing that's uh, a problem with them is that they're highly biased to certain kinds of data, particularly certain taxa, certain species of bacteria, and of course human sequences, and certain kinds of sequences like 16S, cytochrome oxidase 1, internal transcribed spacer regions, and things like that uh, are overrepresented in these databases, and that can kind of skew what you're seeing when you look at things. They can make certain kinds of searches slower than other kinds of searches. So you know, there are lots of other options on the BLAST pull-down list for databases, and I recommend that you check those out. Um, I'm going to mention two of them now that are relatively new that have some advantages over searching NT or NR. Um, the first one is the what we're calling the Model Organisms Database. It's also called the Landmark Database. I will tend to call it the Landmark Database because that's probably easier to say. It's also the same database that's used by our tool Smart BLAST. I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, and then the nucleotide side, we have a collection of representative genomes that's available for searching. These are less biased databases, meaning that there's less skew in the data that's in there. They're less redundant in sort of the broad sense of that word, as there's not thousands of sequences representing the same organism. Um, they're smaller in the case, at least, of the landmark database. Now, that's not true for the representative genomes database. Notice that that database is actually larger than the NT database. But the results are easier to interpret. I just point out that when you use that database, you need to be careful to limit it to a particular set of taxa, which most people would do to get useful results out of it. So these databases are now available directly on um, the NCBI services. So we're going to show you some searches using nucleotide BLAST today, protein BLAST, and a translated search using tblast Um Also, if we're talking about the representative genomes database, you can also find the prokaryotic version of that in the microbial genome BLAST page, which is the circle there. Um, you can link to that page there. And this, of course, is the BLAST. This is a portion of the new BLAST homepage. And so first, let's just talk about the BLAST landmark database. This is the same protein database that SmartBLAST uses. 
It contains RefSeq proteins from 27 different organisms, representing major groups of organisms. So it gives you a broad phylogenetic spread in terms of the organisms that you're searching. Um, it's a small database, so the searches are very fast. And it searches sets of well-characterized organisms and their genomes. Um, it's particularly useful for finding homologs in distantly related organisms. And if you have a human protein and you want to find the homolog in a bacterium, this is the database to use. Uh, it's a very useful teaching tool, especially for teaching undergraduates about um, sequence similarity searches. We did do a webinar on Smart Blast, which uses this database, and you can see that on our YouTube channel, and that's the link to that on the bottom of this slide there. This is a tree that Tom Madden made, um, which is a pretty nice one. It shows you sort of the phylogenetic spread of the organisms that are represented in this database, and it's a much more balanced view of things than you would get by then searching in R. Um, so we have species of bacteria, species of eukaryotes, and some archaea in there. This is available right on the ordinary protein glass page, or the um, you can use it at the translating glass, glass text service too. Uh, and you can see it there. It's the third choice there. You can pick all organisms or landmark to search it. And the query that I've got there is the one that we're going to be using today when we go to the web. That's uh, human catalase. The other database that I want to mention is a nucleotide database, and this is the representative genomes database. What's in there uh, are these high-quality reference and representative genome assemblies. So I'm going to take some time in a moment to talk a little bit more about what those different terms mean. The best way to search, this is the best way to search annotated genomes for groups of organisms. We'll come back to that straight in the end for doing that. Just a couple of definitions. Um, we sort of use two terms when we're talking about genomic sequences. Genome is a little bit more of an abstraction or perhaps an idealization. It really represents the genome as it exists in an individual. So we're going to use the word assembly, which is a sequence or a set of sequences that serve as a model of a genome for a species or a strain. Um, usually it's a haploid representation. And that's what we typically mean when we say the genome sequence of the human. That's going to be our assembly GRCH38. So that's the word assembly I wanted to uh, bring your attention to. Um, and then we also talked about reference and representative genomes. And these are the two categories of genomes that are particularly useful at NCBI. Reference genomes are the sort of the gold standard genome assembly or assemblies to represent a species. For human, that's the GRCH38 patch 9 sequence that's available. To take an example of a bacterium, Asherichia coli, notice that there are six different reference genomes, and these represent different kinds of E. coli, including uh, laboratory strains and pathogenic strains, sort of to capture the genetic diversity of that organism, and also these are things that people typically study and are interested in. Representative genomes tend to be for those things where we haven't picked the reference genome yet. These are computationally selected based on various things, um, how valid we think the taxonomy is, the quality of the genome sequence and the annotation, and to get a good representation of the taxonomic diversity of a particular species. For example, Pseudomonas fluorescens, there are three different representative genomes that have these different assembly uh, identifiers there. And how can you find these things on the web? Well, you can go to the assembly database and do a search like this. And so the database that we're going to be searching today has about 12,000 different assemblies represented in it. Um, and that's a sort of a constructed query that will allow you to do that. One of the caveats here is that the viral genomes are the ones that are not referenced are all representative, but they're not part of the filter. So I have to do sort of a more complicated search to get those. Where can you search this on the web? There are really two places to go. Of course, the standard BLAST page. There you can search the complete reference and reference Genetic genome database there. It really consists of four different components, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, viroids, and viruses. Um, you can search the prokaryotic representative genome separately if you want um, on the bacterial and archaeal microbial uh, BLAST page. And I also want to point out that you know, BLAST databases, you can download those. Um, and the place to go to do that is our BLAST directory on the FTP site. And I just want to take this opportunity just to point out to you that 
Now, what you want, if you're going to do this, is the pre-formatted database, which are available in volumes. And you can download all these, expand them, and then you can search against them directly using NCBI Blast. You'll notice that we do not have yet available the representative genome database for the eukaryotes. That should be up there in the next day or so, I hope. But the other ones are there now. And of course, what I didn't show you is the Landmark database, which is a single file, which is uh, available right now. Okay. So what I want to do now is to leave the PowerPoint presentation for a moment. And I'll show you some results, really, because the searches, some of the searches, especially um, the ones that I want to compare, where I want to show you what happens when you search NT versus um, searching Landmark, those can take a while to run. So I'm just going to show you, I've got some RIDs that I've saved, and I'll just show you the results. So we're going to do BLAST-P. Of course, with a Landmark database, those are fast. Um, I'll show you what it looks like against NR versus Landmark to find fungal, bacterial, and plant homologs for human catalase. Uh, and we'll see that it's not really possible to do that without really expanding your uh, results or your the number of target sequences in uh, search against NR. And then we'll do some um, searches with representative genomes. Uh, we'll do BLAST-N to find some um, annotated genomes. Uh, that have catalase in them. Uh, I picked an unusual taxon here. This is the, the taxon that contains both the whales and the sort of uh, what used to be called even toed ungulates, the hippos, ruminants, pigs, and camels, and so forth. And then we'll do a T-blast end search where we're taking a human sequence and translating a database. Um, and we'll compare the results for NT, for E. coli, versus the RefSeq representative genomes for E. coli. Okay, so let me escape out of PowerPoint. I'm going to go over here to my web browser. Now, what I'm going to do is just basically use my um, saved URLs to retrieve these searches. But just to, before we do that, let's start off just to show you what you need to do. So if you're going to go over here to do a search against Landmark, we'll go to the Protein Blast page. I could pick either NR, which is the default database, or I could pick the landmark database. The query that I'm going to use I have over here in this file. It's on the FTP site. It's in that directory that I showed you at the beginning of this. So I can do a search with human catalase against um, NR. Now that's going to take a while to run, so I'm going to go ahead and just retrieve the results by using this saved RID. So I'll just open a new tab here. I'll just paste that in there. And we have, <clears throat> by default, we're only showing 100 blast hits. And that's one of the points I want to make here, is that because of the sort of skewed nature of what's in here, if I search for the human sequence, I rarely get beyond the mammals. Uh, sometimes I can get to other animals, but I'm certainly not going to be able to see very far back evolutionarily, unless I expand the number of sequences to a very large number. Um, and so we can even see what we got by doing this, a useful way to see what organisms are represented here is to go to our uh, taxonomy report here. And you can see that we have animals. We've only, we haven't really gotten out of the mammals. So um, I have this sort of oddball sequence here, which is a synthetic construct. But everything else in my output is a mammal. It's deceptive because this particular protein has conserved regions that go all the way back. So we should find catalases in all cellular forms of life, but we don't see it using uh, NR unless we expand our output quite a bit. So the thing I can do that's different than that is I can go back. Let me just edit and resubmit this. I'll just change the database. So I'll change the database um, to Landmark, this model organisms database. And we can leave the settings the same. And hopefully this will be fast enough. If not, I'll be already saved. So I'll just let this cook for a minute. And if it comes out to be too long, I'll go ahead and open the URL. So 
So I get a much smaller set of results here. Um, and I also get, clearly, I've got hits to lots of different kinds of organisms here. We can see Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, Glycine macticus soybean, or, and more things from Arabidopsis. So here I've been able to find basically hits in all forms of cellular life. I can see some bacteria. Again, a useful way of looking at that um, is to go to the um, taxonomy reports. You can see all the different organisms here. So basically, I've found hits in all the things that are in that database. And if you wanted to look at it, uh, even more interesting output might be to do a distance tree of results. And you could do that to see what kind of hits you get in these different organisms. You can zoom in to see. In fact, in particular, the way I've zoomed in here, you can see that there's all these different catalases uh, in Arabidopsis and different um, isoforms and different genes. Okay. So that's the main point of this is just to show you how much better you can see back in time when you use this uh, SmartPlast database, and it's a lot faster than searching it on. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is to do some things with the RefSeq uh, reference genomes, representative genomes. So what I'm going to do is to try to find some annotated genomes. I can use the query. Um, in this case, it will be the mRNA sequence for catalase. And I'm going to pick that weird taxon I talked about that contains the whales. And I'll go ahead and just retrieve those results for us. And these are kind of classical looking results of an mRNA against the genome. So you have these individual matches to the exons, uh, and these are basically annotated genes on all these different organisms here. You can see there's lots of interesting ones here. These are whales up here. Here's a goat. Here's a sheep. Um, these are other kinds of um, ruminants here, including the camel, and so on and so forth. Now you might ask, why didn't I show you this against an ARC? Because these sequences, these assembled genome sequences, are not in in R at all. Um, but this is a, and so of course you could search these genomes individually, but this is a way that you can actually search them all at once. So I took a group of mammals and I'm able to get some genomic information out of each one of them. Uh, if I jump down to one of these, let's take the uh, sheep. So here is the catalase. We've hit that gene, um, and I can sort these by uh, Cori start position. Get them in exon order. And if I want to, and we've demonstrated this many times, I can link to the graphics view to see these uh, directly on the genome. So I've got direct access to the alignment here, and there's the catalase gene as it is annotated on this particular um, scaffold of the sheep genome. Now, another kind of search that I'm going to do is to try to look back at this gene in bacteria. In order to do that, I'm going to need to use a translating search. So just to show you what happens if I do that against an R, let's say we're interested in Escherichia coli. And this sort of gives you a, a, a sort of an insight into the kinds of biases I was talking about when we were talking about what's in particular databases. We have a lot of data for Escherichia coli. Work out the way that I wanted it to. And here I'm limited to the tax ID 562. That's Escherichia coli. So when I ran that search, I set it up with that as an organism limit. One of the things I just wanted you to see is the number of different E. coli strains that are represented here. This is unbelievable. And if we we looked at what's here, there are probably more than 2,000 that have proteins. Some of these, of course, have been non-redundified, so there's more than one protein represented by each one of these. 
this is kind of overwhelming in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm not anywhere near the end of this list. Um, so let me just show you that when I do the same search against the representative genomes, it's a little bit cleaner and a little bit easier to deal with the output and the results that I can get. So let's do the same thing. It would be the same search. I would could go back here, hit it, and resubmit. And I would change this to um, RefSeq representative genomes. And I would put my organism limit back there. And then I could just go ahead. Um, but let me go ahead and just load that for you just to save some time. And now we have a lot more, a lot of cleaner results. We have these um, representative genomes here, Rescherichia coli. And so my results are a lot easier to interpret, and it's a lot easier to access these sequences. And these are these high-quality NC records for these different strains of E. coli. OK, let me switch off from the um, web browser back to PowerPoint for a moment. We've done the things that we said we would do for the live demonstrations. Um, and I hope I showed you that these databases can be quite useful. Uh, I also just wanted to remind you while we're here that we have these various kinds of help pages available. The links are here. We have, uh, if you want to know what's going on with BLAST, please subscribe to our BLAST announced email list. There is a help manual for several kinds of BLAST, the standalone BLAST and other things available on that link there. We also have a bunch of fact sheets that are very helpful, and a number of those are about BLAST. There happens to be one in particular about Smart BLAST, where you can learn more about that uh, landmark database. And as I mentioned earlier, we have a YouTube channel. Uh, this recording will be there on the YouTube channel. Um, so be sure to check the other ones out that are there. Um, if you need further help with BLAST, write to us at BLAST Help. And if you have a general question about NCBI, you can write to info. And so now I think I'll open it up to see if there are any questions um, that are of general interest. So the only general question that I see there for now is what is the main advantage of Landmark? The main advantage of Landmark is that it is a small set of data so you can search it quickly. Uh, and it represents in that small set of data the complete range of cellular organisms. So you can sort of, if your question is, you know, how widely distributed is this protein? Is there homologs of this protein in all forms of cellular life? You can answer that question very quickly with the Landmark database. The other way you could use the Landmark database, if you have an unknown protein and you want to know basically what is this, um, you could search Landmark very quickly. And I see another question uh, about how often uh, will the Landmark database be updated? And the answer is uh, it won't be updated unless those particular uh, genomes themselves are updated because they are already completely annotated genomes. We may be, we, it's possible that we might add additional genomes to the Landmark database in the future. Uh, we haven't really discussed that. Okay, I see a question about uh, emailing me. Of course, you can email me. My email address is on this slide that you should be able to see right now. It's peter.cooper at nih.gov. So I do see one more question. Um, how does one mark how many sequences are in the Landmark database? Where on the BLAST results page does it tell you that? Okay, so I'm going to go back and escape out of PowerPoint here. This is the this is my key blast in search. Um, let me go back here to the this is the wrong page, but if we were to look at the if you go to the search summary, this gives you the this is the search summary for the much larger database. Um, if we did the same thing for one of the smart blast searches or one of the landmark blast searches, you can see the same thing. So this is the statistics for the landmark database. OK, so it's about 12.30, which is what time I advertised we would stop. If there are any questions in the chat pod that we didn't get to, I will be happy to answer them in the Q&A document that we produced. 
Um, also, if you have general questions about BLAST, please feel free to write to BLAST Help. Um, so you can always write to that email address that was on the slides, or you can write to me with those kinds of questions. I want to thank everybody for attending today, and I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you.